Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. The patent for the internal combustion engine was awarded to Rudolf Diesel on August 9th of 1898. This is five months after the hero of our story was born. An internal combustion engine creates a bunch of explosions at a high rate. Now I'm going to tell you a similar story about the way that Curly Lambeau created explosions all over the field with the Green Bay Packers. And it all revolved around the forward pass. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast. Where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion. And he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great so now as we step off for DeLorean, the date is April 9th, 1898, and we are at an address in a house of 615 North Irwin Avenue in Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is now a historical site. And the reason for this is because this is the birthplace of Earl Curly Lambeau, the father of the Green Bay Packers. So we're going to refer to him as Curly Lambeau for the remainder of this show. And back in high school, he started in football, of course, at the Green Bay East High School, just five blocks away from his house. Then he would go on to play at Notre Dame. And the interesting fact that comes out of this was he scored the first touchdown for legendary coach Newt Rockney. Now, he only played fullback for one year because he had an illness that forced him to leave school and go back home back in 1918. But don't you fret. That would not stop him from becoming one of the most legendary and iconic figures in NFL history. But let me give you a little bit of a side note on that house. Now, this historic house is uh, available for parties, meetings, and other informal gatherings, basically whatever you need. Now, I'm telling you, if you're a Packers fan and you're in the Green Bay area, or even if you're not in the Green Bay area, you should think about hosting your fantasy football drafts there. And just to make it easier on you, I'm going to go ahead and include a link into the show notes. And by the way, you can find the show notes over at thefootballhistorydude.com. And also, I'd like to make sure you mash that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice so you get the hottest, freshest of the press episodes each and every week. But let's get into the Packers, Curly Lambeau, going back to when he was 21 years old. At this time, he was working at the Indian Packing Company for about 250 bucks a month. Now, this Indian Packing Company would end up being bought out by the Acme Packing Company. And this company was a canned meat packaging company. So, I guess now we know where the team Packers came from. And we talked about this in a previous episode, but I didn't really elaborate about the whole, you know, meat can packing kind of deal. But it's a team that has a name that is referenced for something that isn't just like some random animal or some random, I don't know, place in the city or whatever. It's representative of the company that helped back this Green Bay Packers team at the beginning. You see, Curly and George Whitney Calhoun were given $500 by the Indian Packing Company for uniforms and equipment, and they would end up founding the team, the Green Bay Packers, in 1919. So even though, like I said, they were bought out by the Acme Packing Company, that company would decide to continue backing Curly and all the players that they had to keep the team going. Then in 1921, Curly would end up talking to the officials, you know, like the top dogs over there at Acme Packing Company, and he would ask them to apply for membership to the NFL, which at the time was actually only called the American Professional Football Association. So that kind of gives you an idea. This is an old team. It's the third oldest team in the league. And as we found out earlier that due to, uh, you know, kind of a little bit of shady business having college players on the team, they forfeited the team back to the NFL in 1922. But 
Curly did not want to sit down. He decided that he would buy the team, you know, with some help of other individuals, for 500 bucks. And he put up $50 of his own quiche and promised that he would follow the rules. So this started the rise of the Green Bay Packers organization under Curly Lambeau, where he would become the featured back, like the fullback running back. It was really more called a fullback back then for the Green Bay Packers in the early years. And he was their first quote unquote star, where he would also become their quarterback, where it was kind of different back then. It was really not a separation of a quarterback, fullback, that kind of thing. It was, there really weren't too many passes going on. So it was just the fullback would end up lining back and he would just be the guy to throw the ball. But he would end up throwing the very first touchdown pass in Packers history. He'd also end up kicking their first field goal. Speaking of forward pass, he was a pioneer for the forward pass in the pro football game. And he was one of the most prolific passers in the early years. And it was said that he had brought, I'm using quotes here, Rockney's secret weapon, the pass, to the NFL. And it was also said that the early Green Bay Packers were like their coach. You know, they were impatient and explosive. We talked about Don Hudson in an earlier episode. You know, Don would would not have been Don without Curly and his goofy, strange, wild, crazy thinking kind of coaching theories that at the time were considered very advanced. Now, he helped Hudson and his records stand for four decades or more. The current NFL, and we discussed this back in the Don Hudson episode, really would not be what it is today. Or at least, it wouldn't be the same form, because it would have taken a lot longer for the NFL to be able to grow into this aerial attack, fire from the sky, everything just coming all over the place. That kind of thing. Fantasy football would not be the same. But getting back to the field. Now, after Curly, you know, probably his arm was a little macaroni elbow kind of thing. He couldn't really throw it that much anymore. He decided to retire. And we talked about Arnie Herber, who was a future Hall of Famer, would be his quarterback to replace him. Then also he had Cecil Isbell as his other quarterback. They would pass anywhere on the field, anytime. They did not care. Just toss it up there. They were like a quick strike team coming in, Blitzkrieg, toss it all over the field, and no one knew what was coming. No one knew where it was at. And speaking of a quick strike team, having a solid passing attack is critical in daily fantasy football. Start your story today by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com slash DraftKings so you can get a free entry and your chance at glory. Again, you can go to thefootballhistorydude.com slash DraftKings to get a free entry and start your path to fantasy glory. But let's get back to Curly. You see, he was also considered a hot-headed disciplinarian who would get the most out of his players. And I have a quote that's going to come through the eyes of one of his players. And his name is Ken Kranz, and it goes as such. Curly Lambeau's knowledge of the game helped make him great, but he also knew exactly what he wanted. He was as strict as they come. He wanted things done a certain way. He wanted you to be in time for everything, and he didn't want you out carousing in the evenings, end quote. It kind of reminds me of uh, one Billy B, also known as the Hooded One, who I would say the OG was the Curly One. So. Belichick probably emulated his game, of course, after the likeness of Lombardi, which, who was a precursor? Yeah, that was Curly Lambeau. And just like the hooded one, he had a knack for finding talent. But he was uh, a little more crazy than the hooded one. Uh, His lifestyle and his fiery approach to the game, he wasn't just as calm, cool, collected like uh, Mr. Billy B is. He was known as a salesman, and he always found a way to bring the top-level talent you know, to this little podunk Green Bay town in the middle of nowhere. It's not the same as today. At the beginning, he didn't have the draft to just be able to pluck college players from the sky. He had to go out and he had to recruit them. And who wants to go live out in the middle of Green Bay with all that snow and cheese and all that stuff? Well, when you have this legendary coach named Curly Lambeau, then it would behoove a college player for advancing his career and winning national championships. Well, they weren't called Super Bowls yet, that's why it's just calling them national championships, to go up there and play for the Green Bay Packers legendary coach, Curly Lambeau, who would gain an edge wherever he could. Now, he helped popularize the formation of summer training camps. He also helped popularize the daily practice and film study sessions. And there was an article that I found that said that he was the first to have his team travel via the airplane 
getting them there faster helps with the practice, the rest, and all that other thing. But at the time, there was a lot of risk to flying in an airplane. So the article would say that the coach, in his infamous wisdom, would split his teams into DC-3s to further destinations. You know, it's like, hey, Johnny, don't worry if you don't make it, because uh, at least Billy and the other planes are going to, well, hopefully make it, and we'll still be able to feel the team. It may seem crass, but hey, if you got to get there, you got to get there. And an article in the journal Sentinel said that players bought life insurance policies and team standouts Howie Ferguson and Al Carmichael even named each other on their uh, $50,000 policies as beneficiaries because they were on different planes. And hey, well, if one of them went down, at least that guy's going to get the money, that kind of thing. So that's all I got to say about that. But uh, supposedly it was a big spectacle to watch the team leave and return in the airplanes. And uh, well, I don't know, sounds all a bit risky for my tastes and reminds me of this clip from the Tommy Boy movie when there's an airplane scene and uh, they pretended to be the flight attendants and there was a David Spade when he was going through all the little you know announcements and all that kind of thing there was this part where it's all like and okay now life preservers these we may need although what are the odds of us actually hitting a lake my money is anything it's going to be a mountain you got all the passengers of the plane, they're all like freaking out, looking at each other like, what is this guy? And Chris Farley takes a life preserver and he goes, flates it. And he's like, ah, he starts choking. He goes, I can't breathe. And then he goes, you know, that, that crazy Chris Farley funny voice. And he <laughs> goes around and he pokes it with a, you know, a pen or something that deflates and just typical Chris Farley craziness. And to kind of wrap it up a little bit with Curly Lambeau, that's what his offense was like. It was craziness all over the field, and it must have been just insane for the defenses to try to cover the pass when it was totally new to them. They couldn't even breathe because they were running all over the field just trying to keep up. And going back to that first summer training camp, he was the first to build a separate training facility. Well, he actually, he didn't build it. He kind of bought over a hotel, and it was called the Rockwood Lodge, but it was destroyed in January of 1950 by a fire. Even though there were other reasons, it was said that this decision that ultimately cost them $50,000 did not sit well with the management, leading to his departure. I'm like, you serious? You've got this legendary coach? He, he built his teams to practice and made all this money and you want to get rid of him? Like, what's the deal, man? I'm sure there were some other things going on, but still, you got to do what you got to do. And now you got everybody else in the league who got smart and they went and they took all their players to different places and they got focused on the game and then they would come out in the regular season and they would have success. And that's what he was trying to do. And maybe it was a little bit unorthodox at the time, but there's another quote that came from Ken Krantz about the Rockwood Lodge and it goes as such. Three years earlier, he convinced the Packers to buy a beautiful hotel outside of town, a place called the Rockwood Lounge. And it wasn't so we could have a nice spot to stay on the nights before games. It was housing for all the players on the team for the entire season. We slept there, ate our meals there, and even had nightly bed checks. The players who already were married and had families had to stay there as well, which they didn't like one bit. They even complained about the practice fields out there because they were rough and hard on the feet. End quote. So like I said, it was something that Curley did because he wanted to represent the team as one unit, and he wanted them to have discipline. And that discipline would then translate into the field and help them win six NFL titles. And we talked about this before, but the Packers organization is the only not-for-profit organization. And back when they were having troubles, Curly Lambeau was there to help kind of ease that transition into, well, we're going bankrupt and we might have to just disband the team. And then that, you know, the guy over there from the newspaper gets together with some other dudes and they decided to start selling shares of the Packers and they got enough money together and now it's a not-for-profit owned by the people kind of a football team which is just unheard of in other sports organizations but then curly lambo would pass away on june 1st 1965 and at the time the stadium where the packers played was called new city stadium but they ended up after he passed away renaming it to lambo field in his honor now the lambo field has got to be one of the most legendary bucket list type of venues for any true NFL fan to go to. And of course, we've got the Lambeau Leap. He was also inducted as a charter member of Pro Football Hall of Fame class 
1963, and there's many reasons, but some of which were that he had 35 seasons in the league, he ended with a 229, 134, and 122 record with six NFL titles. I mean, come on, he only had one losing season in his first 27 seasons. That's just not fair for all the other teams. But something that kind of struck me was, did you hear that third when I, when I gave you the stats? 122 ties. Totally different from today's NFL. That's just a crazy stat. And if you go to Lambeau Field, which was named after him in 1965, you're going to see a statue of Curly Lambeau. But with that being said, Jean Nicolette, a French explorer, visited the area of Green Bay back in 1634. He named the area La Baie Verte, translated into the Green Bay, due to the greenish color of the water. Therefore, Nicolet may have founded the city of Green Bay, but Curly Lambeau was the one that put the city on the map. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Football History Dude, and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets of one of the most legendary coaches in NFL history. Now next episode, we get to learn about the life and career of one of Curly's standout players, John Blood McNally. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.